Praise God. All right, it's good to be here. <laughs> wow, we got a, a quiet crowd today. <laughs> yeah, well, let me tell you, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I've been excited to preach with you. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about me and my wife real quick. Uh, that way we can get to know each other. That way I'm not a stranger up here. We can, uh, you can know a little bit about me. Uh, I am a missionary kid, and which means uh, uh, the way I introduce myself a lot of times is I'm a missionary, in di- uh, well, a foreigner in disguise, really, because I was born in Argentina. I was raised there. I grew up playing soccer. I went to public school there. And so really, I, I, my culture just leans towards Latin America. So I love hugs. I love kisses. I mean, I'm not, I'm not shy at all. I don't have a personal bubble. So I, I, I love the, the warmth in this church, how kind and, uh, and uh, friendly you guys are. So thank you so much for letting us be here. Um, so um, I come from a missionary family. Uh, my grandpa, uh, Richard Todd, was a missionary in Argentina for 52 years. Uh, he started five churches and uh, youth camps and um, my dad, uh, also, he's a missionary in Argentina. He's still there. And uh, it's funny, you know, he uh, didn't think he was going to be in ministry. He's like, oh, that's something God calls other people to. So, uh, but as soon as he was taken off from Buenos Aires in the capital, he, uh, he felt God's just pressing his heart. And so then he married and came back to Argentina. And uh, so I grew up in a family where I never had to wonder if God loved me. I uh, never had to wonder if uh, God was a good God and a good father. Um, and it wasn't until I was five years old that for the first time I, I heard that he also needed to be my savior. And uh, never since I accepted Christ, it's been a wonderful journey of just finding out how he can use a broken person like me, a flawed person like me, to preach the gospel. And he's given me an unbelievable burden for, for lost souls. Uh, are we going to do a, a correction here? Here, I'll turn this off real quick. <laughs> Hold it down. All right, can you hear me? Oh, I prefer a microphone anyway, so it's, uh, it's okay. Yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, I, um, I grew up loving the church, and uh, God, uh, I honestly can say that when I, when I gave my life to God to be in ministry, it wasn't that I had to have this profound moment where God uh, revealed himself to me and I had this, this uh, supernatural calling. I, I wasn't necessary because God already had me. He already had stirred up my affections. He had already wanted, uh, you know, had me uh, to serve him, and I, was, I just had to be obedient. So ever since then, uh, I've been walking uh, with the Lord, and I went to Bible college at Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, uh, where I learned how to be a student, where I learned how to read and um, grew in my knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. And uh, since then, um, I've been a missionary in, in uh, Lima, Peru. So I, I lived there for over a year and got to do all kinds of fun things, uh, teach in a seminary. Uh, I got to preach uh, at conferences and youth camps and really uh, just do a lot of wonderful things where uh, I got to meet Elmo and Kat, and our friendship really got uh, much deeper uh, so uh, uh, our hearts are very dear to them, and it's funny how uh, the, the, the role that they've kind of played in our lives, because uh, f- uh, one year after I left, well, maybe not a, a full year after I left Peru, uh, my wife, uh, now wife, went on a missions trip to Peru, and uh, whenever she was there, uh, Elmo, you guys can ask, we'll tell you the story later too, but uh, Elmo said, hey, you need to talk to Michael Todd, and uh so sure enough, like whenever she got back to the United States, she sent me a message, and uh, I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> so, I, yeah, so I, um, I basically, I was, I was raising funds still to, to do some church planning in Argentina, and I said, wow, I'd love to take you out on a date, and, and I'll buy you a cup of coffee, and, and, but th- this is July, and I, but I didn't, I didn't know when I was going to be able to get to New Jersey. That's where my wife is from, New Jersey. And uh, I said, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to be in New Jersey in, in uh, uh, October. And it's like, okay, all right. But we got to talking, and uh, two, about two weeks in, uh, she messages me and says, uh, hey, two weeks, or, or, you know, October is too far away. Is it, is it okay if I fly down to, to, to Dallas where you're at so you, you can take me out on a date? And I'm like, yes, you can. So uh, I didn't know, I didn't realize if she knew what she was getting into, marrying uh, someone who wanted to preach and be in ministry, and, 
And uh, I told her right out of the gate on our first date, you know, this is my, I want to be in ministry. I want to preach the gospel. And I, wherever that means, that could be as a missionary in Argentina, that could be in the United States. But, um, and I, I, and this is what I told her. I said, I think dating is fun, but I don't date for fun. I'm looking for a partner in ministry. And, uh, and she said, well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I'm not here to waste your time. And so, so guys, I, I have... Uh, the hypothetical woman I didn't think existed. God just provided me the best helpmate that I could think of. And so uh, you should get to know her because she is amazing. So um, we're glad to be here, glad to be with you. And I feel privileged to be able to preach the word of God this morning. But before we get into the word, I'd love to uh, start us off with a word of prayer. Sound good? Are you here with me? Amen. Good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray over this next moment that you would give me clarity of thought, clarity of speech, so that uh, you can just remove all distractions in this room. I know a lot of us are going through a lot this uh, this week, especially through a pandemic. I don't know what everybody's walked in the door with this morning, but I could imagine that some people have a lot on their mind. They're worried about their family, their friends, their finances, a job, and or whatever stress uh, that they've come in with. God, we want to pray over them this morning, that even just for these next 30 minutes, that they, well, you would remove all distractions, that you would bring their hearts and souls at peace so that we can focus on your word. Lord, we want to give this, this time to you, and we just want to honor you with our attention and our hearts. Please use us and soften our hearts so that we can receive your word. We love you so much in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So uh, I wanted to tell you a quick little story. Um, I love Disney World. I don't know if you guys have heard of Disney World. It's kind of a, a little startup project. No, Disney World is, is fantastic. I love it. And, I, and one of the perks of being a missionary kid uh, is that we got to go uh, to Disney World. There was a, mission, a pastor's family that said, hey, uh, we would love to send your kids to Disney World. Have they ever been? I said, no. And so, uh, my, and if you want to do something cruel to your grandkids or your kids, just tell them that they're going to go to Disney World in six months. Uh, because... You have no idea the anticipation that builds up in a heart of a child when they're going to go to what they perceive to be the happiest place on earth. And so I remember that that changed everything. You know, I put up a picture of this. is That's my sister. That's Stephanie. And that's me back in my animal phase when I loved Jurassic Park and I had a bowl cut haircut. So... <laughs> um, but we, we, we were so excited to go to Disney World. It changed everything. You know, when, when, when we were having a bad day, uh, you know, or we got in trouble with mom and dad, and then they, we, we, we were punished or something, or we were, it doesn't matter what was happening, all my parents had to do, all they had to do was say, hey, life can't be that bad, we're going to Disney World, right? It's like every single thing that we went through, it's like when you think about it, you get excited, what's it going to be like, you know, who, we're going to get to meet Mickey Mouse, and uh, I even got tackled by Eeyore, he came and chased me down when I was there, I mean, but the whole process of going to Disney World, every time we got closer and closer, for us, we were in Argentina, so we had to fly to Florida, and then in Florida, we were like, oh, we're almost there, <laughs> guys, we're almost there, and the day came, and then we got to the park, and I don't know if you know anything about it, it's a, the biggest parking lot you've ever seen. Uh, it is massive, and when you arrive at the parking lot, well, we're like, Dad, are we there? Is this Disney World yet? Are we here yet? And, and it's like, no, not yet, not yet. We get on a, on a little tram, and then we go like a few miles, and then we get on a train, and then we take the train like a bunch of like distance, another a few miles, and then are we there? Are we at Disney World yet? Are we there? It's like, no, not yet. And then we finally get to Disney World. And it is, it is spectacular. We're, we're just having so much fun. And we get to see, meet the characters. We got their autographs. And it, it was amazing. And my little sister, she had like this, this Disney moment when uh, we were in front of Cinderella's castle and the fireworks start going off. And in her little heart, she just looks up. She's like, this is the best day of my life. And the reason why I want to tell you that story is because when I, when I was preparing this message, I realized that we have something way greater to look forward to, don't we? As children of God, we look to a paradise, a heaven that is so spectacular. That should change every single bit about our lives. It should change 
the way you go through trouble. It should change the, the way you go to work. It should change your view on every situation that you walk through. Because we're going to heaven. Not only that, we're going to heaven forever with Jesus, with our Savior. And that's what I want to talk because we have some more spectacular that we're going to and something to look forward to. And I want to uh, talk to you for a few moments this morning about our response because heaven is a place where we're going. And I, it's a place where I've been dreaming about getting to, to be with my Savior. And it's affected every part of me since I was a little child. I've wanted to know my God, to feel his presence, to see his face. And it's changed every single decision and outcome in my life as I pursued knowing him every day in the word as, as much as I possibly can, not perfectly, but through my faults and my failures, he still has stirred my affections to get to know him more. And the reason why I think this is such an important topic is a lot of times I think there's things we want more than we want God's reward, eternal reward that's in heaven. There are things that we place value on in this short time we have on earth we, we value them more than we value the treasures that God has for us in heaven and meeting our Savior. For, and, and it looks different for everybody. It's not just one common theme for everybody, but uh, it, it, I don't know what yours, yours is. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's your family, proximity to your family. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's success. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it's your comforts. Maybe it's you want to see your daughter walk down the aisle. Maybe you just want to see your grandchild walk down the aisle. Um, there's all kinds of things that we seem to think that is more valuable than where we're headed. And we, it's so easy to lose sight of that. You know, the, the two things that I think that's important that we, that we understand is and the two points that I want to talk with you this morning is that whenever we... Prepare for paradise, right? I had several titles, titles for the sermons, like your response to heaven, prepare for, for paradise, whatever which one you, you like best, you can go with it. But the two points I had for you is that whenever we live in light of eternity, in light of heaven, is that we leverage our resources, number one, and then number two is we want others there with us. We want others there with us. We're going to read a verse in, cha in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. If you have your Bibles, uh, if it's electronic or physical, that's fine. You just go ahead and join me there. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. We have Jesus uh, giving some parables. And a lot of times Jesus would tell these parables and uh, he's kind of answering this question, you know, what's the kingdom of heaven like? What's the kingdom of heaven like? And you know, so when we think about that, right, like what's heaven going to be like? What's the kingdom of heaven going to be like? And we, we kind of, oh, what's he going to say? Is it like chocolate or is it like something that we like? Is it, you know, what, what is it going to be like? The, the pleasures or, you know, all the things in this world, the beautiful things in this world that he could possibly use to describe it. And, and th this is the verse that when I admit, when I first read it and started studying it, if, it was confusing. So let's read it together. Verse 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. That's confusing, right? <laughs> Well, what's the kingdom of heaven? It's like a field where there's a treasure buried, but then you go, get, you go buy it. And so, so what, what's, what's he trying to say here? Because it's a little bit confusing uh, when he's trying to describe this. And the, a few years ago in 2018, I guess a couple years ago, uh, I remember seeing this on the news. And it didn't get much airtime, but I thought it was so interesting, right? It was on Fox News, CNN. It was on all of them. But uh, there's a particular island. It's called Marcus Island. And if you can uh, switch it to the, the picture there, you see it? It's not that impressive, right? And I, think it's, uh, I think the dimensions is like a mile long or uh, a mile by a mile. It's not very big at all. There's not really anything on it either. There's, I think there's a landing strip and a little house or something. But I can imagine if you wanted this island uh, before 2018, you probably could have buy it, bought it. It's, it's like one of the, it's off the, the coast of Japan, like far out in the middle of the ocean. It seems kind of insignificant, right? Like, why would you want to buy that? But I assume if you wanted to buy it, you could probably buy it for a million bucks. I don't know. I don't know what islands cost, but 
I, but I assume, right? Um, but you wouldn't do that if you didn't know what that island was worth. In 2018, it was on the news that some scientists found that there were some of the richest mineral deposits on the planet for, uh, build, that are very, pretty rare to build camera lenses, technology, iPhone lens, uh, uh, screens, uh, all kinds of technological uh, creations. And, and there's so, the sediment is so big that we, almost for the foreseeable infinite, like a semi-infinite uh, future, we will have enough of that mineral. And it is now worth $500 billion. $500 billion, like with a B, billion dollars. That's, you, if you would have bought and purchased this island, you would now be the richest person, richest person on the planet maybe five times over. Bill Gates is what, worth around 90? You would be five times richer than Bill, Bill Gates. Now, what would, I, what would you do if I told you, hey, I got a hot scoop for you? There's this island. Let me tell you, if you can get the money together, oh man, it's going to pay out. It's going to be worth it. You have no idea the immense worth of this. What would you do? <laughs> what, what would you do? Uh, I mean, I am positive that most of us in this room, because we're human beings, we would beg, we would borrow, and God forbid that we would steal just so that we can just get this on, because we understand the the insurmountable worth of this place, right? And what, the, what Jesus is trying to say is that that's what heaven's like. It's a place that if you understand what it's worth being with Jesus in, in heaven, you would give everything up for it. You would give everything, all your resources. You would understand that there's no price that you wouldn't pay to get there. Not only that, I mean, you, you would want people to come with you. So that's my first point is we are going to leverage our resources. We have to do it. And, and I know when we say the word resources, people immediately, we gravitate towards money, but that's not everything. Money isn't everything. You know, it could be your time. It could be your talents. It could be where you live, the strategic place where you live. It could be your job. It could be even just your belongings, things that you have that you leverage, that God has entrusted to you to be a steward to re for his kingdom, you would leverage all of it, all of it, and you would count it as lost for the sake of knowing Christ and gaining heaven. I think that a lot of us have, we, I would ask, like, when did we stop believing that heaven was worth it? Because heaven is worth so much. And, and we, we're living in a society where uh, they're trying to get us to believe in the American dream. Right? They want us to uh, spend money on all kinds of things and lay up treasures on this world and put so much value on the physical world. And uh, I, I have another verse for you. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Uh, I, I want to read it for you, what God has to say about um, treasures and and as you're going there, I'll just read the first phrase. It says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. What if we just stop there for a second? What if we just took that for face value and we don't try to build our kingdom here on earth, our little safe space where, where we never have to step out and be uncomfortable? What if we took it for face value? Let's keep reading. It says, where moth and rust doth corrupt... And where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break, th break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I just want to ask, pose the question, so where's your heart this morning? Where's your heart? Are you laying up treasures in heaven and looking towards eternity and what you want to do on this earth for God's kingdom? What would you do to gain heaven? What's it worth giving up? And I don't know about you, but uh, I'm kind of good at justifying things. 
you know, a lot of us, you know, we, we live, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not okay to have nice things, right? You know, we need cars, we need jobs, we need houses, but the thing is like, why that car? Why that house? Why, why does it have to be a certain one? Um, because what defines us is Jesus Christ. And so uh, we can have things, but what's our strategy? So to leverage our resources for our community, for your neighbors, for this city, for Albuquerque, like, what can we do? Like, that should be a part of our heart and our conversation. What can we do to leverage everything we have, our time, our resources, our skills, our ability, just so that we can reach our neighbors, our communities, our coworkers, and so forth? But I'm really good at, like I said, I was, I'm really good at justifying expenses. You know, uh, we, we were doing a lot of our budget. My wife and I, we just got married. Um, you know, our, our anniversary is coming up, but we got married on October 12th. And, you know, we talk a lot about our budget, right? Like our budget. And so I've become a, like a, a, an expert at justifying a lot of things, you know, because, in the, because I want to be a good Christian, right? I want to be a good husband and provider, and I want to be responsible. You know, uh, you know, Lord willing, if we have kids, which would be fantastic, I want them to be able to go to college. So I got to start thinking about that now because college is more expensive more and more. Uh, you know, I had to save up for the engagement ring. Uh, I, you know, then I want us to be able to retire. You know, we have to think about all these things. So we're, we're, we're putting away this money. And so, you know, what if I can't work? What if I lose my job? And what, what if, uh, or I get sick and, and we need to have like six months of expenses according to Dave Ramsey, right? Like we, we got to have six months expenses in the bank case okay, so, so we can pay the rent, buy food and uh, get another job. And, and then, um, what about the emergency fund, right? Like, what if I get in a bind? What if I need it? What if the car breaks down? And, and so we're already talking like hundreds, of probably a few hundred thousand dollars right at this point, right? Like with just, just because I want to be a responsible person, right? And that's not wrong, but I, would, I just want to say for a moment under the banner of that emergency fund, right? Under that emergency fund, like whose emergency are we saving for? Because what I want to say this morning is like, there's emergencies all around us. There's emergencies all over this community, all over the, the, the state and this country. And, uh, the, here's this, and I could look up some more statistics, but these, these are just some of the big ones that I, I looked up. And uh, 7.6 million people die of mal- malnutrition. But that's roughly 21,000 a day. Uh, UNICEF says that there's 1.2 million kids who are traffic, trafficked every year. Um, there's about 60 million abortions that are performed a year, give or take, uh, worldwide. I mean, aren't there emergencies all around us? We don't get to take, we, and I'm not saying to not be responsible. I hope you don't take it that way. I hope you don't, you, you don't hear that I'm saying to be reckless and, and to be a poor steward of your, of, of your life, your time, and everything. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that we need to uh, have a broad perspective about we're, we have a world out, outside these doors that needs Jesus so badly. And we're, we're seeing and experiencing the consequences of a world that's given to sin. And we have real emergencies that we need to strategize, we need to work towards, we need to leverage our resources. And, and why do we need to leverage them? Because we want other people to come with us, right? We want other people to come to, to heaven. Because I don't know if you heard, you can invite people, it's free. <laughs> you can invite people, it's free. The reason why we, invite, we pray for our wait, waiters and waitresses and we ask, can I pray for you? Is there something I can do for you? Uh, there's a reason why, you know, we uh, love on our neighbors, and we find out if we, we, we try to learn their names, we try to see if we can take care of their lawn or, or uh, do something nice for them, so supply their need. That, that, that's why we do that. That's why we send money to missions. That's why we give so that other people in other places who don't have access to the Word of God can hear the preaching of the word of God. That's why we give. That's why we leverage together our resources. We want others to come with us. And you know what's better than inviting someone to go to Disney World with you, right? You know what's better? It's, it's better to invite people to go to heaven, to go to heaven with us. I, uh, my, my heart is, is so broken for so many people in this world. And, and um, 
and, but, but we live with this tension, right? We live with this tension of wanting to, uh, to go to be with God because we have this spectacular place. We, we, want, we just can't wait to get there, right? We can't wait to see our Savior face to face. We can't wait to experience his presence, his love, and worship him. But then again, we have all these people who still don't know him. So what do we do? So we live with this tension. And, and someone else in Scripture also lived with this tension. This is the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians. I want to read um, a verse to you, a, a few verses in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Paul uh, literally writing this letter from prison, right? He is uh, in a very dark situation writing a book about joy. And he said these words, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I would not. For I am in a strait betwixt too, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He didn't know which one was more necessary and better because he longed to be with his Savior, but he knew that God had a plan for him. He had a will for his life. And, our, and we would not be standing here if it were not for the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And I want to say to you this morning that God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. If you are here today, you're in this building, it's because God brought you here on purpose. You're not here on accident because you go to church every Sunday. You're here on purpose, hearing the word of God. And I want to tell you that God has a purpose for your life until he calls us all home. He can use anybody. And let me tell you, I don't want to go to, go to heaven yet because I don't want people to go to hell. And Paul felt the same way. He didn't want to stick around because he wanted to travel, because he wanted to have fun, because he wanted to go golfing, or because he wanted to experience some kind of pleasure or vacation. No, he wanted everyone to go to heaven and be with Jesus. He wanted everyone to be able to go. And he, uh, and he was willing to do whatever it took, whatever it took to do that. He, he didn't hold on to a lot of preferences, and he traveled a lot, and he met all kinds of people from all kinds of cultures, creeds, race, uh, geographical location. He was all over the place. And this is what he said. This is what he shared when he was writing to the Corinthians, right? You, you don't have to look it up. I'll read it for us. But it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20. And it, it says this, and Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might, I might gain the Jews. And then it says, uh, to those that are under law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, in parentheses, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as, became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. Let me ask you a question. What are you willing to give up so that someone can gain Christ? What are you willing to give up so that someone else can gain Christ, so that they can come to know Jesus? What would you be willing to do so that someone would be able to understand Jesus and what he did for us on the cross? And I want to say, I want to say this morning that if the answer isn't anything, if the answer isn't anything, according to Scripture, walking in holiness with God, if the answer isn't anything, then we need to reexamine our hearts. We should be willing to do whatever it takes, whatever the cost Whatever God would demand or ask of us, we should be able to go for it and do it. And I've been to a lot of 
uh, you know, missions conferences. You know, I've been a missionary and a pastor, and I've traveled a lot, and I've been in a lot of conferences. And a lot of, a lot of pastors ask me to talk about calling, right? They ask me to talk about the call of God, and, and we've kind of made it kind of mystical. We made it a little bit like it's a still small voice, or what, what is, you know, sometimes it, it seems like, I don't know, am I called? Am I not called? And, and you know, some of those things that some people say that kind of stick with you. My dad said, you know, when he was trying to, he preached this a lot. One of the phrases that stuck with me that's kind of burnt onto my heart. He says, why do you need a call when you have a command? Why do you need a voice when you have a verse? You know, and I've heard that, that also I've heard this too. It's like, well, what am I going to do? I don't have the gift of evangelism. You know, I, I get, I'm, I'm awkward, I'm weird, uh, people are kind of nervous around me, um, I, I'm kind of eclectic, or maybe that's not your thing, but let me tell you, you don't need the gift of evangelism, right? You don't need the, the gift of evangelism. Uh, God uses a bunch of fools, 12 disciples, to, to reach the gospel to the modern or to the ancient world. And not only that, um, I think God will use you despite you. God's going to use you the place where you find where you think is weak, and He's going to use that pl- part of your life to get glory. And so, let me tell you that you don't have to have to have to have the gift of evangelism. Someone illustrated it to me this way once, and, I, and it all and I thought it was so um, apt. If if you were walking down the street, right? You're walking down the street here, and you have one of your friends that's crossing the street. He's listening to headphones, you know, he's listening and jamming, you know, you can't hear him. He can't hear anything. He's distracted. And you see an oncoming truck. And I, I don't know if any of you have heard this illustration, but this, the truck is moving forward. Uh, he, he's not stopping. And then all of a sudden you're like, I don't have the gift of life saving. You know, let, let's ask, uh, let, maybe Elmo, maybe, maybe he's more fit than I am, right? Like he can, he can probably do like a dive or something, I don't know. You know, I don't, I'm not gifted at that, right? The answer is, of course not. Of course not. We wouldn't do that. We would yell. We would scream and say, get out of the way. Run, like you would run. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have a committee meeting to find out, let's, okay, let's strategize. Okay, so we have approximately 13 seconds. And so I, no, you, you would run towards that person and you'd push them out of the way. You don't need the gift of evangelism. You just have to want people not to go to hell. Because if you understand that hell is a real place and Jesus used this more, he talked about hell more often than heaven and hell is a real motivator. So if Jesus used it, then we certainly can. We don't want people to go to this place, which is uh, an eternal place where uh, the absence of God is all that's there with pain. We need to invite people to come with us. We have people that we love in this in the city, right? We have people that we love, people we interact with, people that God loves. And there's a car coming. There's, there's a truck coming, right? You know, you know the, the crazy thing about death is like uh, for every person born, someone dies. Right? It comes for everybody. The statistics are pretty rough. You know, and, and knowing that we're all preparing to go there, we ought to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. And I know it's, we're talking in generalities, but a lot of times we... We do it often, right? We kind of put our preferences and our kind of our comforts over or that, that awkward, like, well, you know, we, I can't really get to them. You know, it's like, it, and we make these excuses, right? Because we're not willing to step out and be a little bit uncomfortable for a minute. I want to be able to uh, share the gospel with every person. I don't know about you. Do, do, do you guys, have, has your heart been broken for your community and if, what would you, and I would ask you, let's leverage our resources and let's invite people to come with us to heaven. You uh, don't need to know a lot of things in order to make a huge difference for the Lord and the world. You don't need to know a lot of things. 
But you do need to know a few things. A few things that are great. And be willing to live by them and to die for them. Uh, people who make a, a difference in the world are, aren't people that are, have mastered a lot of things, right? The, those people aren't the ones that make a difference. They, they are people who have been mastered by a very few things that are very, very great. If you want your life to count, you don't have to have a very high IQ, a very high uh, EQ. You don't have to be smart or good looking. You don't have to be athletic. It doesn't matter where you went to school. It doesn't matter how you feel. You just need to know a few basic, simple, glorious, majestic, obvious, and unchanging, eternal things and be gripped by them and be willing to lay down your life for them. And that's encouraging because that, that, that means anybody in this room can make a difference for the cause of Christ. Anybody in this room can make a difference for the cause of Christ. Because it's not about you. It's what you're gripped with. One of the really sad things for, a lot of times in the church today is that we, we really don't care if our life makes a difference, right? We, especially a lot, a lot of my generation, what we're being told, what we're being sold is that we need to maybe finish school, get a good job, find a husband or wife, have a nice house, a nice car, long weekends, good vacations, grow old and healthy, have a fun retirement, die easy and no hell. Don't go to hell if you, you live in church or believe in Jesus. And that's, you know, what we call the American dream. And, and it's sad because a lot of them don't, get, they don't care. They don't care if their life ever makes a difference, and that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy in the making. In 2014, when I was still in Springfield, Missouri, uh, in, in my home church, and we got word that a missionary, I don't know if some of you, may, I know some of you may have heard of her. Her name is Marjorie Browning. Marjorie Browning was a missionary for over 50 years in the jungles in, in the Amazon. And we, we got word that she passed away. And her story is one that's gripped me, and she's honestly one of my heroes. She uh, had dedicated her life to share the gospel in the most difficult places on planet Earth, in the most remote, that takes days to get to, and even on horseback and canoes. She's in the most difficult places, sharing the gospel in, in, in these villages. And she was experiencing a series of home invasions, right? And it was by the same person. And she refused to, to report this person. She refused to ask for help. She refused to condemn this, this young man that was breaking into her house. One day, uh, this person, very high on drugs, came in and ended her life. As she was praying, as she did every day, uh, you know, people told me that, you know, they walked into her house where she was, and she had the Bible open, and where she died was next the place where she prayed every day. And let me ask you something. Is that a tragedy? Because she gave her life sharing the gospel. She did not waste it. She gave everything up. Not only that, we found out later that she had put, she had been living so frugally that she had put so much money apart in a trust and gave it all to missionaries so that they could get to the field for the first time and they wouldn't have to cover any other expenses. Incredible. Because a lot of us would, you know, I would, I would say that she gave her life for the loss of this world. She gave, paid the ultimate price. She gave everything up, and then her life was not wasted. 
But let me, let me read to you what I think is a tragedy, and it's a, and it's a lie that a lot of young people are, are being sold today, and they're buying it. And we needed this to end right now in the church, okay? Like, I found this article in uh, Reader's Digest, right? I don't really read much, but uh, I, I found this article, and I, and I, I, just, I just wrote, wrote down, down a little, little clip, clip from it, from it okay? okay? So, so let's, let's listen. listen. It says, this is, uh, it says, Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on a 30-foot trawler, play softball, and collect shells. If you ask me, that's a tragedy. The American dream, right? Like, the American dream. On their final chapter, before they are going to go and give an account to their creator in the years where they have the most influence over other people in their life, the most impact, they're going to stand before a creator, the God, and say, look, Lord, my shell collection. I got a really awesome softball swing. Like, isn't that neat? I think that we should imitate and long for and dream to give our lives to Christ and make our lives count for something in eternity. Though there's only a few, a few things that are going to count in eternity. It's the word of God and the souls of men. And if we're not investing in eternity in this next generation coming up, I think we're going to be, we should be afraid or maybe even embarrassed to stand before God when we haven't done all we can to get out in front and try to reach people for the cause of Christ. And this is my desire because I know you guys got an awesome staff. I've got a chance to, I know Elmo and, I, and I've got a chance to meet your pastor. And let me tell you, you all should be excited. All right? You guys should be excited. You have some visionaries, some people that, that have vision. They can look into the future and they have strategies. And they are ready to put down a lot of energy. And I, so I'm excited for this church. And so I, what I hope is that what happens in this room is so contagious that it'll echo not only in Albuquerque, but it'll echo several times over in this country and around the world, and even more so than it already has been through your faithfulness. As you, I've heard of your faithfulness, and it brings me so much joy how much you guys give and are generous, and you're still here. But man, it's time. It's time. that We're not done yet, right? There's a lot of work to be done. So uh, I am going to pray for you. I want to pray for you and that God would grip us. That the Holy Spirit would stir up our hearts and make, give us a holy discontent. That we would not be able to sit comfortably until we are moving towards God's goal of reaching and sharing the gospel with a dying world. And I'm confident that God's going to do that. And uh, I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but I hope that God is moving in your heart he, and, and that you know that God is not done with you. Uh, he is working through you and through your influence and everybody in your circle is going to be blessed through you. So I'm going to pray. Let's bow our heads uh, so that we won't be distracted. Let's bow our heads so that we don't uh, look over to the side and we, uh, we want to focus on Christ in this moment. Lord, I... I want to pray for my family, my extended family here at Berean Baptist. I know that you have a plan and a purpose for every single person who's sitting here today. We have an immense and glorious promise of having to spend eternity with you. And we do not want people to go to hell. We want to bring people with us, God. Please break our hearts just as you did in the early church, that we would hear the preaching of the word of God and be broken and have a heart, a humble attitudes and be, be able to say, what shall we do? To be ready to serve and to volunteer, to do whatever it takes so that we can share the gospel with the next generation, with someone else in our community. Use us, Father. We know that you're going to call people, and there's a harvest out there, and we know that you're going to call the laborers into your harvest, but we want to volunteer. We understand that you call and, and anoint people, but we want to respond and volunteer just as Isaiah did. 
Lord, thank you for the leaders that you are bringing here. Thank you for the people and the faithfulness that I see in these chairs. The years of devotion and following Christ. And I ask that you would stir them up by the power of the Holy Spirit and embolden them to preach the gospel in such a way that that would be the only thing anybody ever remembers about them. Lord, I love you so much, and I pray over my church family here, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.